good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Schreier. I'm a member of the board here at Crossroads. I want to thank you all for coming out here on this beautiful evening to uh, learn a little bit more about land restoration. I would like to go ahead and introduce at this time Nancy Ayton. Hi everybody, um, we are super excited to have you here on the inaugural event of Crossroads new initiative, the Land Restoration School, um, that we are so excited about. Dan and Chris and I have been working really hard on getting the school going, but let me tell you just a little bit about Chris before he starts talking. Uh, Chris Young is a project manager of the Urban Ecology Center Institute in Milwaukee. He's a professor of biology at Alverno College, affiliated professor of history at, at UW-Milwaukee, and curriculum chair for Crossroads New Land Restoration School. Chris has been exploring the natural world as long as he can remember, starting on a small farm west of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. He lived and taught in the Pacific Northwest before moving to Milwaukee. He's an author, an editor. His PhD is from University of Minnesota's program in the history of science and technology. Throughout his teaching career in higher education, Chris has taught courses that focus on evolution, climate change, environmental history, the natural history of the Pacific Northwest, the natural history of urban green spaces in Milwaukee, social impacts of science, as well as biology and science methods for teachers. One of the things Chris has studied and written about extensively is the complex story of the deer on the Kaibab Plateau in Arizona written about first in the 1920s. A story about predator-prey relationships, about carrying capacity of populations, about Aldo Leopold, about the role of science. As Chris wrote in a science education text, students can benefit from hearing a more elaborate history rather than providing simplified historical anecdotes to accompany simplified scientific principles. We should prefer to offer insightful cases that exemplify diverse scientific understanding where process and content are intertwined. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Young. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy, and thank you, Dan, for really making this possible, for bringing me here. Uh, I'd like to thank Crossroads, uh, the, the board and the staff. I've had a chance to meet a number of, of you through Zoom and in person on recent visits, and it's really exciting to be here tonight for this occasion. Um, after that introduction, I, I feel like, well, there's a lot of things I should clarify that, that didn't sound like anyone I know, but I, I <laughs> appreciate it, and I, I, I'll do my best to live up to some of that. Um, and actually, it's a helpful context for some of the things I'm going to be talking about this evening. So welcome, and thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and to, I mean, on such a beautiful spring day, I got a chance to walk around with, with Coggin and get a bit of the tour um, and be more familiar with the place where I, I look forward to spending a lot more time in the, the weeks and months and years ahead. So let me talk a bit about where restoration begins. If you know anything about the history of ecological restoration and, and projects that have led to this kind of work, uh, you might be familiar with Curtis Prairie at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, their arboretum has a, a degraded land that was converted to an experimental plot uh, that came to be known as the Curtis Prairie in, in uh, honor of John T. Curtis, a plant ecologist at the university. And that prairie was uh, established in 1935. Where does restoration begin? People around the world actually would say the Curtis Prairie. And that's not so far away, so that's exciting. But I have a, a little bit different story to tell, or a story to tell in addition to that, this evening. Um, the story of where restoration began for me is a little more recent and a little bit farther away. This is a picture that I took in August of 2018. Uh, there's a cornfield in the foreground and beyond that, if you look off to the right hand side of the picture, are a group of trees in a, in a grove that are part of the farm place where I grew up in Hassan Valley in McLeod County, Minnesota. 
And I stopped one day along a country road and looked across this cornfield and saw that place. And I now can look back and say, something happened there at that moment. And I, I happened to take a picture, and this happens to be the picture. And it's kind of, kind of strange for me to think, like, what came over me or what I might have recognized in that moment. Um, but it was, it was sort of a sense that I was at a point in my life where a lot of things were changing. And a lot of things that I had looked back on, this farm place, um, would, would take on new meaning and different meanings in the years ahead, in, in the last uh, three and a half years especially. So, um, so I, I use that as a starting point point for myself. And what I want to offer a little bit this evening is a, a reflection that is both a story of the broader field of restoration ecology and the process of restoration, and in, in part a personal narrative that I hope will resonate with certain experiences that, that you yourselves may have and might give us a bit of a connection and, and strengthen your connection to this place. So I've had a lifelong interest in the outdoors, as Nancy mentioned. I, I worked and taught in the Pacific Northwest for a number of years, uh, partly because I was drawn to places like this. This is False Bay um, uh, Marine Biological Preserve on San Juan Island in the, in the Puget Sound area. And uh, pictured here with my daughter, uh, who's beside me looking at yet another thing that I'm holding up to show her and ask her questions about. Um, and, and joining her are a couple of her friends who are the children of one of my dear friends from uh, my, our years growing up. And I've, I've looked back on this picture over the years and thought, what a moment, what a place to be, what a thing to be doing uh, with people that I care about. And I need to spend just a little bit of time um, setting context for this. Um, as I mentioned, this is a, a place that I've visited many times over the years, uh, especially after living and teaching out there. Uh, it's also, uh, as a biological preserve, it's also the site of a field, uh, field science station, a marine biology station, it at the Friday Harbor Laboratories, which is now the laboratory for the University of Washington. It was originally, believe it or not, the field laboratory uh, and field station for the University of Minnesota. Uh, and so important were field stations and are still the field stations uh, that are around the coast as marine stations and other ecological stations. So important are they that, uh, that universities actually share them or found them in faraway places just so that they can claim uh, some access to those uh, research areas. So this is a special place. Another special place along those lines is the Woods Hole Biological Laboratory, which is on Cape Cod in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I've been there also many times and had the pleasure of studying with a variety of uh, historians like myself and philosophers, as well as, of course, biologists. And we especially enjoy outings around the Woods Hole Labs where we can enjoy some of the, the sanctuaries, the, the nature preserves that are in that part of the, the country as well. So I have this history of exploring these places. Uh, and it's part of a scholarly interest. It's part of the, the work that I do writing about the history of ecology uh, and history of wildlife management. Um, but it's also a personal history that includes places like this northern Minnesota lake in Cass County, uh, uh, Leech Lake. This is a, a beach on the south shore of this quite large but not particularly well-known lake. Uh, and, and I think partly because of the name, people say Leech Lake. <laughs> Really? Do you swim there? <laughs> yes, of course. Are there leeches? Yes, of course. They're big. They're like really, you know. So anyway, but a very special place for me, a uh, place that we've gone back to every year, um, as well as the place I mentioned earlier. This is um, the, the, the farm place where I grew up. And this is actually a picture taken just a couple of years ago uh, of a prairie that was restored uh, planted uh, and work done a lot by my father. And you know, this is the, the result of a long period of work and 
uh, effort around what I have to consider uh, to be restoration. So I've given you a, a quick overview of kind of a number of things, and most of this is just part of my personal story, uh, so, so I appreciate you kind of uh, following along with that, and, and maybe you see some connection with me, or maybe you don't yet, um, but I hope by the end that context uh, will come back and, and will be uh, important to the, the way I'm telling this story. So to just return to uh, that, that moment on that uh, country road, I was planning a project in the summer of 2018 that would focus on uh, a couple of key ecologists who helped to found the fields of plant and animal ecology in the early 1900s. And so the, the project I was going to write, the project I am still working on, honestly, uh, is a history of that work and a history of uh, these two individuals. So one of them is Henry Coles. Uh, if you know a bit about the history of uh, Door County and the work of Jens Jensen, you might recognize Cole's name, uh, and, and I pronounce it Coles because that's how he pronounced it, but if you've always seen that W and had to say Cowles, that's okay too. Um, but uh, he would say Henry Coles. And I have a couple of pictures here from the University Library uh, at the University of Chicago that I took in May of 2019. And both of these pictures include Coles, uh, and they both include also groups of students that he took on field excursions. And the one uh, on the, the left-hand side as you're looking at it is uh, his class at Cedar Breaks, which is in the American Southwest. Uh, he took students on a trip that must have been in 1923, a kind of logistical nightmare or adventure to top all adventures, depending on your perspective, uh, by rail and by car and Model T, you know, Ford and various other conveyances. He took them through the desert uh, to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, which is especially remote to the, the rail lines. Um, also the location of the Kaibab Plateau, uh, as, as I've studied in more detail, uh, and continued with this class into the Pacific Northwest and actually took that class on that trip in 1923 to the bay just adjacent to the bay I was uh, pictured in, False Bay, uh, right next door to that, which is no longer a public uh, preserve, but is, is still there a uh, place to visit. But he, he made those stops because there were places of biological interest along the way. And particularly when he got to the Pacific Northwest and to San Juan Island, he was drawn to the Marine Biological Laboratory at Friday Harbor. And so having students take an excursion like that uh, over the course of many weeks of the summer uh, was something that not every college professor would would take on. Certainly, I would not. But uh, I, I applaud his, uh, his ability to, to take those adventures. And one of the things you might notice in both of these pictures, the other one is, is a more familiar location for many of you, I'm sure, uh, the Indiana Dunes on the south shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, and in both of these cases, his classes consist, you might notice, of quite a few young women. Right? This was a period in the early, 19th, or early 20th century when women were more and more allowed into degree programs, but not particularly welcome, uh, and in many cases uh, were restricted to the kind of degrees that they could pursue. And the field of plant ecology as it was emerging was especially open to women. And Coles was a, a masterful mentor and guide in bringing groups uh, out into the field and showing them uh, how to experience nature, how to study nature. And his ambition was for there to be more teachers of biology and of botany. Uh, and, and he would take students uh, wherever they had the interest. And this was a, a field that was, was especially open to women. So kind of an exciting way for us to look back and see where did opportunities open up? Where did possibilities expand? Uh, Coles was one of those, one of those pioneers. Uh, the other person, oh, that turned sideways somewhere in the mix. Um, 
So the other person I want to mention is Victor Shelford. And Shelford was actually a student of Cole's at the University of Chicago, uh, went on to teach at the University of Illinois. And in the picture uh, that you see here, with the water flowing uphill, I think on the, the video it's going to work out just fine because it'll, it'll be fixed. Um, but Shelford also traveled to the Pacific Northwest and spent time on a regular basis at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Puget Sound um, with his students and doing research. Uh, and was, like his mentor, uh, a great champion of bringing students into the field and giving them experience and exposure in a wider range of, uh, of landscapes than they would normally uh, or easily have access to. Uh, in fact, Shelford was such a champion of this that he worked on a committee for the Ecological Society of America to publish in 1926 uh, a kind of landmark volume that outlined the areas across the Americas, not just the US, not just North America, but across the Americas that should be preserved. They called it the Naturalist's Guide to the Americas. And the, the primary goal of this volume is to show any audience uh, of, of, interested, uh, of interested readers the value of these places that needed to be preserved. Right? If you're a scientist in the 1926 and, and you look around and you see some of the changes that are taking place with industrialization, the railroad for heaven's sake, right? road building and cars and draining wetlands for farmland, um, you saw that there was a huge risk to these natural areas and ecologists wanted to be at the forefront of protecting and preserving them. So they created this, this whole compendium of places that ought to be preserved and this is the map they created in 1926 to say, we still have all of these areas available to protect and preserve. And sure enough, if you look, there are some little squares left in Wisconsin. There are a couple of squares left in Minnesota, including the Boundary Waters canoe area um, and the, uh, the area around Leech Lake, actually, where I mentioned, uh, and lots of space in the west through the mountains and into the Pacific Northwest, the Cascades, and even the Puget Sound area with the Olympic Peninsula and the islands I was just mentioning. So this was a great opportunity for ecologists. Their focus was on preservation, and the reason to preserve those places was so they could study them, right? Uh, and so this takes place somewhat after John Muir and Gifford Pinchot sort of famously had their standoffs about conservation and preservation and the establishment of the forests and things like that. This was for scientific purposes, uh, and Shelford was a great champion of this. So I'm, I'm sharing that because I want to uh, create a, a little bit of understanding that preservation uh, is a noble and worthy goal of scientists and, and for many of us as well. But my theme tonight, again, is restoration. And I want to make a point that restoration is not the same as preservation. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I'm, I'm just, I still want to tell you so much more about this scholarly project uh, where I was looking at, Col at Coles and I was looking at Shelford and, and then I was doing more reading. I actually had a sabbatical. I was uh, away from teaching for a semester and I was able to do additional reading and really focus on these other, it turns out, great naturalists, right? The great naturalists that would include people like Alexander von Humboldt and Charles Darwin and the list goes on and on in this particular volume just as a a way of representing this, we could go from Aristotle to Asa Gray. Uh, and it turns out then it sort of just peters out. Uh, just maybe not so many great naturalists after the, you know, 1870s or 1880s. And that's actually uh, a kind of turning point that, that we sometimes look back and recognize because we'll say that the scientific tradition took over, right? That modern science became more specialized and more focused. And so there was less need for these generalists, these naturalists who studied you know, the whole world, who spent all of their time out in nature, uh, and we could become more focused and more, more specialized in our, in our research. And um, I, I started to you know, feel a little uncomfortable about what I was studying, thinking about these naturalists and thinking about how important, how great they are. 
Um, but I, I read on and I was excited to learn more about uh, naturalists in Wisconsin, uh, about people like Jens Jensen. Uh, you can kind of go down the list here. I, I read more than this, but this was just kind of a sample of things that I thought were really worthwhile and helped broaden my perspective, helped me understand more what I was studying uh, because I wanted to be able to dig deep into the work of Coles and Shelford in particular and really understand their motivations and the work that they did with their students uh, and how important that was. But along the way in this scholarly project, um, I had some, some great opportunities that you know, many of you probably can recognize. You want to go places. You want to see them for yourself. And so I traveled to the Indiana Dunes, now National Park, right? And I saw Coles Bog, right? So this is Coles Bog. This is me standing with a great big smile on my face. Uh, and in April of 2019, believe it or not, for the first time, after living in, Mil in Milwaukee for almost 20 years, I actually got off the freeway in Baraboo and stopped at the Leopold Shack. And uh, this is a picture with Lauren, who's one of the educators there. Uh, I got a tour with Kurt Miney, who was available that day. I actually have a great picture, I decided not to include, of Kurt with a, with a broom sweeping, kind of clean up the shack a little bit. It was April, you know, things need some tidying up. And, and Kurt's the, you know, the eminent historian and scholar of Leopold's work. So to see him with a broom in hand was, was pretty, pretty charming. Uh, and so I, I, I felt all of the enthusiasm of this scholarly project kind of coming together. And I honestly, I felt like an Elvis fan going to Graceland. It was sort of this <laughs> pilgrimage experience. And I, I don't know if you have been to the shack, if you've experienced anything like that, uh, but it was, it was truly transformative. Uh, I had the opportunity just the, the week before. Uh, actually, I, I met an author who had written about the shack and gathered together a lot of the, the family's writings. Um, and so I had read that book and was, was really primed for it. So it was a great experience. Um, and, and so things were kind of moving right along with this project. And I felt like, OK, I'm going I'm to be writing this for the next couple of years. Uh, it's, been, it's been good work so far. And I you know, had my family with me in, in the Indiana Dunes Park and you know, just made the most of this trip. But you know, that was kind of the, where I started to think about this project as, as being about something more than just the, uh, the, the reading that I was doing. Uh, more than just the stories about these long since uh, gone uh, reputations of, the, of scientists who I was studying and, and, and wondering if that feeling I had when I was at the shack, you know, of, of really coming full circle and experiencing something there, um, that there was maybe more to that story. And so, um, a couple of things came together. I mean, I had known Nancy and Dan for a couple of years and was really enjoying uh, the, the way that my class could interact with them and learn about some of the, the work that they were doing. Uh, their, their company, uh, Landscapes of Place, I don't know if I've told you this, it became kind of, a, kind of a mantra in my mind, kind of an inspiration. I started thinking maybe I could write about places so there are landscapes of place, and we learn how to rework them, and there are narratives of place. And I was going to use this. This could be my little company, and I could like, do this for people and, and help them to understand where they live and, and, and what's happened over time in the place where they, um, where they live or where they uh, enjoy visiting. And so I had a couple of these were coming together, these ideas. Um, and then I also had an opportunity. Of, uh, worked over the, the previous couple of years with, with a friend, Ken Leinbach, who's also here in the audience by, by some you know, surprise. I, well, I picked him up and brought him here this evening. <laughs> but, but he came willingly, in fact, a little insistently. So now, now the, the thing that I had worked up to, to include Ken here is going to seem like I just did this because you're here. But I was going to say this. Um, so Ken's work at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee has been an inspiration for me, uh, and, and the work that the center does with, with uh, people in cities is really 
uh, important to, I think, so much of what we look ahead to, uh, so much of how the, the, the world we live in is structured around you know, city life and around urban life and, and the opportunities to do all the things that I've just been describing, to go to all the places that I've been talking about, uh, are not open to a lot of people. And that is sort of became the, the question that, you know, does the world need another book, another story about these ecologists who made important, obviously important contributions, but who are part of a fairly narrow tradition uh, where, frankly, most of the scientists that I was writing about, they, they look like me, right? They, they look an awful lot like me. And, and I, I've been working with students um, for 25 years who have different backgrounds and different experiences and connecting with them with the stories that I tell about, you know, spending time in Puget Sound or spending time, you know, on the East Coast, they, they just kind of, you know, that's not as resonant to them. So I was looking for a way of, of making that connection uh, and, and at the Urban Ecology Center, there's a, an effort to share the model of what's happening in Milwaukee with people in other cities. And I got involved as a volunteer with that, and then um, we talked about maybe some other possibilities. I said I could, I could probably take a, take a break from teaching, uh, go on leave, and, and actually work for the Urban Ecology Center to do that. And so um, th this all came together, and I don't know how we're doing for time. I'm not wearing my watch, but I'm going to talk a little bit about 2020, and maybe I should just leave it here. Like we could just stop in 2019. <laughs> 2020. Oh, it's like things get a little, a little, uh, little off the rails. But um, Nancy and Dan and I, along with Ken, got together on I believe it was March 10th, 2020, and we had a little celebration dinner because. Things were going along, and we had some really great ideas and great projects uh, looking ahead. And I just I remember taking this selfie right in front of the UEC, right? And just saying, wow, this is so exciting. And three days later, right, my kid stops going to school, I stop going to work, you all stop doing most of the things you would normally do. And, and we all took a big pause saying, well, what is this? really all about and it was kind of hard some days to think about you know what was next or what we had done it all for up to this point and it didn't seem to relate at all to the scholarly work that i had been doing but something else i realized is that that day in minnesota when i took that picture of the cornfield and thought you know i need to understand what is in front of me here, what this represents, what this place is about. I started writing that day. I started writing that day and I wrote every day for a solid year and a half until uh, around this day. Um, and I ended up with what I thought was just a bunch of like really personal and uninteresting and, and poorly composed stories that no one would ever have to read. But during the months ahead, I started reading, or continued reading, because I could kind of gotten interested, um, a, a bunch of more memoir-based accounts of experiences in nature, uh, of mostly written by people who don't look like me, uh, by women, by people of color, by indigenous people, uh, whose experiences represented a much wider range of what nature had to offer. And it didn't always inspire me. Sometimes it, it hurt a little. Sometimes it was, it was challenging to think through how different opportunities will be for people in other situations. And so I had a lot to grapple with there, but I, I was intrigued by it and I was inspired by it. And so I continued and eventually I thought, huh, maybe some of that stuff that I've written Sometimes I use a stronger word. That stuff that I've written, um, you know, might come into play or I might be able to edit it into something else. And as I was considering that and, and wondering what might come next, uh, I had the opportunity to teach a class again in the, 
in the fall of 2020 and in the fall of 2021 um, with, with my students at Alverno. Uh, this is a picture in the Menominee Valley in Milwaukee and, and Nancy and Dan are uh, disguised there among my students. They're the ones wearing hats, right? The, I mean, the naturalists, the experts, they're always, they're wearing the hats, right? Um, I, I tell my students that and you know, it's, it's easy. You just get a hat and go out, stand in the tall grass, and people will assume you know what you're doing. Um, but you know, just that experience of teaching with students again um, didn't have quite the same uh, meaning for me that it had had, uh, and, and I know it's important, and I look forward to it every time I have the opportunity of, of being with students uh, and, and working the best I can to inspire them. Um, but there seemed like there were other things um, that, that I was gonna, gonna have to work on. Uh, and, and some of that was, um, was with you know, myself. And as I continued to have interactions with Nancy and Dan, and they began to talk about the Land Restoration School and the ideas that they have for Crossroads, uh, I, I got really inspired and really excited. And part of it is because you know, those, those farm fields around the place where I grew up, they, they've, been, they've been stands of corn and soybeans my whole life, and for a generation before that, and, and maybe even a generation before that. But before that, they were something else. They were, I mean, they were something else. Uh, and I could catch glimpses of those places. And uh, I've seen you know, the possibilities, even in degraded brownfields and polluted spaces, urban spaces in the city of Milwaukee, I've seen the kinds of transformation that happens. And it's really exciting and it's really inspiring to see how that experience of being in nature makes a difference for people. Uh, it makes a, a difference for a moment for a minute, for an hour, for an afternoon. And it makes a difference for a lifetime uh, under the right conditions, with the right circumstances, with the right mentor, with the right program that keeps them coming back. And so I was really uh, kind of excited to pull these pieces back together, right? And to think about restoration in a new way. To think about restoration of land, but also to think about the restoration of, of a life, an individual life, a person's life. And I wouldn't have thought that I was somebody who needed restoration. But it turns out I'm probably not alone. I found some things in the last two years that really set me back and, and I needed restoration. And so I drew on these experiences. I drew on the reading that I've done. I drew on the experiences that I've had traveling to these different places. I drew on the strength and, and experience of friends and family and, and now I'm drawing a little bit on, on this place, on Crossroads, um, because I think there's a lot to offer here. I think there's something very special here that goes beyond even just this community, this community that is so fortunate to have this place and who has worked so hard to have this place and, and to bring it to where it is now uh, and has visions for it in the future. Uh, there's, there's potential even beyond that, which I'm excited about. So. If you bear with me, I got one, one text slide. You know, there's lots of words on one slide. Um, but I, I, I started with the title, Where Restoration Begins, and, and then I kind of forgot about it, and then I got back to it, and then I thought about it again, and I realized that the pictures that I had sent to Nancy to promote this thing was a picture of me at the UW Arboretum where restoration begins, the Curtis Prairie in the background. And the other picture I sent was that picture of the cornfield. Because I thought those two things represented restoration. And, and then in the process of putting this together, I was like, wow, that they, those are the two places that I can point to in my life and say, that's where restoration begins. And, and I told you this whole longer story about, um, about these scientists and about their, their work to preserve areas for study because I wanted to make this contrast that restoration is different from preservation in a couple of important ways. Restoration allows us to take the time to understand where we have been, right? Maybe not where we started, but sometimes that's part of it, but something of where we have been. 
and to really reflect on that. Restoration is also a process, right? It's not, I mean, sometimes people talk about it as a goal, but I think it's better thought of as a process. It's, it's the, the steps that you go through uh, thoughtfully, methodically, with planning. Uh, if you want things to turn out well, it, it takes a lot of planning. And that planning is about having criteria. And you can even use words like, well, we want to know what's good. We want to have something that's beneficial. We want to create something that is healthy. Those are the kind of craft criteria that we, that we craft for this. And, and I think there's also something there that points to the idea that there are values behind this, that, that we come together as individuals and as communities with our values in front of us and we say, you know, what is good? What counts as healthy? And so we start to establish priorities for restoration. And, and that's something that we do uh, individually and as communities for land and, and for ourselves in our own lives. And ultimately then, I think restoration is what we choose to bring forward, right? Where if preservation is that thing we try to keep, keep it just the way it is, restoration is where we can look back and say, all right, that was all great, but there's not room for all that anymore. That all isn't possible. Some of that is in the past and will remain there. But we can choose what to bring forward. We can figure out what will fit. And we can even find ways of fitting those pieces together that might be even better or beneficial to ourselves, to our communities in ways that wouldn't be consistent with something if we just preserved it as it was in the past. So this idea of what we bring forward is, is my, my offering to you, my, my challenge to you, to think about where you've been, uh, what you've been through, and what you've brought along, what you have chosen to bring forward um, in order to restore this place, uh, in order to restore aspects of your own lives. And with that, I, I can only say thank you. Uh, I have tremendous gratitude for the opportunity to, to speak with you today, to, to share part of my journey uh, and what I've been learning. And also thank you for this opportunity because I plan to be around here for a long time to come and I'm excited about the possibilities of, of where this restoration, this looking back and bringing things forward will take us and, and take us together. And I hope there will be many others who will join us along the way. So thank you very much. So along the way, I had to remind myself 15 times that I wasn't teaching and I shouldn't stop and make sure everything was clear and are there any questions because, you know, it's a little more of a lecture format. So I try to keep it rolling. But maybe if, the, if we have a few minutes, I would take a couple of questions if anybody wanted to, uh, or comments um, that you wanted to throw at me. Um, have done so many things, you should be a lot older than you look like you are. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a statement, not a question. <laughs> I, I, I was going to, you know, along the way, I could have said that, that picture I took in August of 2018, I was 50. <coughs> so I just turned 54. And I, I think, you know, maybe a lot of this you could just chalk it up to, oh, it's midlife, you know? This is, this is where you start thinking about these questions. Your kid goes off to college and, you know, all that. So, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a piece of that that experience kind of piles up at a certain point. Yeah. Could you explain more about the students and your program that Dan and Nancy are um, bringing forward? Yeah, I think I, I think as, I, as far as learning and who, who, who can come and right. be a part of that. <laughs> right, so this, this summer is our inaugural year. Uh, we're offering, for the first time, uh, an eight-week session in land restoration and we had a uh, kind of uh, somewhat open invitation but we started with people who knew someone who we could connect to so that we would have like a pipeline of people we we thought might be available might be interested might be you know kind of headed in this direction already uh, and and we've 
you know, got six really great participants lined up and we've got a spot open we're still uh, trying to decide what to do with. And they're from mostly across, <laughs> you're putting your hand up like me, me too. <laughs> so in our inaugural year, we think we're way ahead of schedule, but we hope that over the next couple of years to build the program to 12 participants, uh, and, and we may rethink some of the format depending on demand. Um, we'd like to have a place where everyone can stay uh, together to, to live and work for those eight weeks to learn together and uh, to do this work here at Crossroads to actually restore the place, you know, restore areas and, and have student ideas kind of filter through and, and test things and use some experimental methods. Um, so this is, we're, we're just getting started, so we'll put your name on the list, we'll put all your names on the list um, and, and keep, you, keep you informed because we, we expect that it will be a growing endeavor. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the curriculum for that? I can. I, I'm actually the curriculum chair, so... <laughs> are, are these planted questions? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. So, we have actually, Nancy and Dan are um, land restorationists uh, with tremendous experience and credentials uh, who will be teaching a number of sessions throughout the summer, throughout the eight weeks, but they've also uh, invited guest faculty to join us from UW Green Bay, from UW Madison, uh, from uh, the, the state geologist will be one of our guest faculty, uh, a number of others, a few people closer by here who have credentials um, to teach in, in this format. The, the staff is going to be involved in the teaching and the facilities team is going to be helping to prepare some of the spaces. So we've got uh, everything from soils and uh, mosses to plants and habitat restoration, um, aquatic and wetland restoration, all squeezed into a very intense eight-week session um, uh, with, with a focus on ecological restoration. And the hope then is that each of these participants will walk away, um, but come back, walk away into a new phase of their life where they're working actively in the field of ecological restoration um, and, and we'll, we'll build that cohort from year to year as we conduct new studies and new experiments across, across this location. Yeah. yeah. Um, Crossroads has been here probably about 20 years or so. That's right. A lot of changes have taken place. What's your initial reaction to the condition of Crossroads at this point, just from kind of what you've seen? Yeah, well, with, with other experienced experts in the room, I, I, I am very tentative, but I, but I will say uh, it's, it's fascinating to consider the history of this place, right? The, the different phases that it's been through, um, you know, where some areas grazed heavily but never uh, never really plowed or never cut um, and, and other areas that were intensively used in agriculture and in other ways uh, and and the way um, none of it really represents what Shelford or one of these early ecologists might have said that's a place we need to preserve right that's you know in pristine condition that represents a primordial kind of um, habitat uh, it, it's all been kind of trampled and trammeled in, in some way or another. And that gives us the opportunity to, to think about that history. And so I'm, I'm excited um, both by the, the process and the, the place as it is now, like the progress that's been made. I mean, the piles of buckthorn that have been cut and hauled away uh, or have yet to be hauled away because there's a new, new tool on order that's gonna take care of that, which is exciting. But, you know, there just has been so much work done, especially in the last couple of years, but built on a couple of decades, right, of, of really thoughtful and, and uh, careful planning. So I'm excited about what's possible, and, and I'm excited that it's going to be ongoing, you know, for a long time. Like, this, this doesn't have an end point. This isn't going to look like a prairie from the 1820s uh, in 
20 years from now or 100 years from now, it's going to look like something that has been restored uh, and that serves this community in, in new and important ways. Yeah. Yeah. So are you saying restoration versus preservation? I mean, I understand the difference that you would totally explain to us, but are you, when you're, you, when you're using the word restor, restoration, are you trying to restore it to what it used to be or just restore it into what it could be? That's the great question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think versus future. <laughs> right. I think not the not the first, right? We're not we're not gonna. It would be, it would be a stretch to say we could restore it to what it used to be. I would say we probably could not fully know what it what it was, right? So restoring it to that to have that as our goal uh, is is a little bit beyond, you know, possibility. Um, so it opens the second part of that question up, like what. Do we want it to be? What should it be? And that's where, uh, as much as we are going to use the scientific, you know, knowledge that that has been accumulated over generations, we're still going to have to reflect on our values. Like, what what should it be? What could it be? Uh, what do we need it to be? You know, do we need it to be a place for you know fourth graders to come on field trips. Well, yes. Do we need it to be a place where you know when we get a lot of heavy rain in the spring, it doesn't wash out the whole creek bed? Yes. I mean, we, we're going to be able to establish things that we need it to be or that we um, would value. And that's going to take input from a whole community. It's going to take the, the, the thoughts and ideas and, and probably disagreement or, you know, kind of uh, understanding of what, what's at stake for one group and, and what else would be preferred by someone else. So all of that is, is what it could be. So what you're saying then is that you, you scientists, people argue about this stuff. Yeah, we do. <laughs> oh. yeah. Really? Yeah, because, you know, usually I am not right, but I want people to think I'm right, so I'm going to, yeah, so. I didn't see that in your pictures, arguing. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know, that's a very well-kept secret. I mean, that's, that's why we have those field stations. We go off, you know, in a remote place, and then we argue. And, yeah. so. and we also, like, get along. Like, these are, these are great ideas, and, and that idea is better than the idea that I had. But, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will the restoration days, you know, with the students, is everything here at Crossroads or will they be venturing out? We're going to venture out two times because we want, especially for, for the participants who are not from here, to be able to see a little bit more of Door County. So we're going to go up to Meridian County Park and we'll go to a couple of places that are part of, you know, land trust land and just to see the range, right, of, of what's possible and, you know, kind of what the lake looks like on this side and what it looks like on that side, you know, some of that. But the rest of the time, they'll be here, day in and day out, you know, uh, and, and continuing the invasive species removal and continuing to practice some of the, some of them have more scientific background from this cohort uh, than others, and so there'll be some work at just, you know, kind of plant taxonomy, learning some of the basics, and in other cases, uh, a student who's had a lot of experience with that will be able to participate and, and share that knowledge and, and move on to the next project. Uh, and by the end, they'll each have designed uh, a kind of a plan for restoration for either some little area, you can correct me if I'm wrong, some little area of the preserve or some kind of set of standards that they, you know, for a species or for a, a grouping of species that they're particularly interested in. And from one year to the next, like the next summer, summer of 23, the next cohort will come in and they'll see those plants. They'll know what their, their predecessors have done here. Uh, they'll know what Nancy and Dan have done. They'll know what the volunteers and the staff have done. Uh, and they'll see progress from one year to the next. And it'll all be here. Do, do they receive credit for this? Uh, we don't have, you know, like college credit. It's a, it's a summer, um, basically, it's, it's more of a certificate course. Uh, it's not affiliated right now with any university program. Um, 
we have we have a mix of undergraduate students, of recent graduates, and and students who've been out a little bit longer and are are looking for like what's the next way to use what I've been doing. Yeah. Thank you. Very practical questions. This is good. It's like is somebody on the board. Is that <laughs> <laughs> good. All right. Well, I, I'm happy to answer more questions, but maybe we should um, go to the upper chamber and have some refreshments. Yeah, I will say, uh, anybody who wants to stay for a conversation and a glass of wine, it's great. But I also, you know, the spring peepers are calling and it's a beautiful yeah. night. So please make sure you go for a walk too. So uh, thank you all so much for coming. Happy to talk upstairs or outside.